Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. It's Patty from ultraslowrunner.com. In today's video, we're going to be talking about healing through fitness. And I'm very lucky to have my good friend Kyler here. He has a very inspirational story on how he healed through fitness. And uh, so I'm really excited to have him here. In another video, I did share my experience with eating disorders and how running helped me overcome that and and how healing it was, the whole process of running and uh, becoming a distance runner and uh, how that really helped me become stronger and, uh, and healthier overall. And so Kyler and I have some similarities in our story, so I thought it would be great to have him here to share his story, uh, again, because it's a, it's a super inspiring story. I've learned a lot from him, and I think those of you watching could learn a lot from his story as well. So I'm going to uh, open it up a little bit and uh, introduce Kyler, and uh, you can start a little bit with your story. Yeah. And just kind of introduce yeah. yourself. All right. Yeah, so I'm Kyler, and uh, my fitness story kind of revolves around uh, growing up in an um, uh, ex extremely religious, strict uh, homeschooling family. Um, and so uh, that, was, that was all I knew uh, growing up and uh, ended up um, uh, escaping when I was 22 and then uh, joining the Marines and then discovering uh, the health issues that I had and um, starting to work on that and that's what kind of fostered my obsession with um, health and fitness and mental emotional wellness and and all of that but um, most of the issues stemmed from the stress of growing up in that um, angry controlling religious home and um, and so it included uh, hypothyroid and hypoadrenia and Epstein-Barr virus and um, uh, the symptoms I experienced growing up was extreme fatigue and inability to build muscle. And so until I was 22, I couldn't get heavier than 120 pounds. If I worked out, I got weaker and smaller. And, um, and I thought, well, if this is how um, intense it is in my youth when I'm supposed to be in my prime, um, how bad is it going to get really fast as I get older? And it was super discouraging and, and really overwhelming. But um, I didn't assume that there was no answer and there was no hope. Uh, so I kept pursuing it and um, learning from people and asking questions. And uh, that's kind of what uh, kickstarted my journey toward uh, fitness. Mm -hmm. Great. I like how you mentioned the emotional connection mm -hmm. uh, because that certainly was my experience. Running is very physical. But I think the strongest component for me, where I grew the most and learned the most, was actually the emotional connection to um, to running. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I have a question for mm -hmm. you. When did you notice that fitness became part of your healing journey? You described a little bit about your childhood, yeah. and um, and then how did you make that connection between your healing process and then fitness? Yeah, yeah. Well. Um, I think I all along I hoped that fitness would be a part of my healing journey mm -hmm. um, and when I was a kid I knew that I was experiencing extreme fatigue and um, and I wasn't as strong as my younger brothers and I didn't have as much energy my energy tank was just going down every day uh, starting about 50 60 percent and then dropping mm -hmm. um, and so I always felt like I needed to exercise and so I would try, and then I would wipe myself out. Mm -hmm. And um, even with just moderate mm -hmm. routines. Right. So um, nothing seemed to be working. I knew there was something wrong, but I didn't know what it was, and I wasn't sure if there was any hope mm -hmm. to, um, to um, experience benefit from it. Right. And, um, but then I started getting ready for the Marines, and this was before I found out what the health issues were. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that was when I got away from my my home um, a little bit, and it was the first time I was taking ownership of my life. And I think that's that was the first observation of the mental emotional piece was mm -hmm. um, I was saying, okay, no, I'm not going to follow this plan that you have for me. I'm going to choose uh, this pursuit mm -hmm. of my own free will, 
and um, so making that decision, owning my life direction at that point, <clears throat> um, was what um, was a first step toward um, becoming healthier and a little bit stronger. So I started researching and figuring out what, uh, how many calories I needed to eat in a day, and then what foods were higher. Back then, it was just the um, the old-fashioned calorie count book, right. and so I would look up all these foods and like figure out which ones were the most. I made these blender mm -hmm. drinks and stuff, and I didn't even know about protein powder yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I was just blending up uh, bananas and apples and peanut butter and uh, almond milk and like all the stuff mm -hmm. to try to get uh, more calories in, and I started experiencing a little bit improvement in energy, a little bit improvement in strength. I went from 120 pounds to 130 pounds over eight months. As I was wow. getting ready for boot camp, and I was like, "Wow, this is so cool!" Yeah. And um, and so I was super excited about that. Um, and then later on, after uh, boot camp, and after finding out what the specific issues were, and and even more lifestyle modifications, um, I I started noticing that as I um, there was a correlation between my courage and my owning my life and my progress in physical strength mm -hmm. right. and so they they were they both when one hit a roadblock the other one paused mm -hmm. and then i would get through that and the other one would keep going and then i hit right. a roadblock somewhere else and then right. and they were so correlated um and that was when i realized that all areas of health are really connected mm -hmm. and you can't you can't get super successful in one area without addressing right. the other areas too right Absolutely. So yeah, so the, it was kind of a a a, um, a theme all along, but I, I believed it was part of my healing process, mm -hmm. and then I didn't realize how much a part of my healing process it was going to be until I got into it a little right. bit. Yeah, right. And that's some of what I experienced as well when I got into running. And I think uh, I was going to ask you. Um, I don't think we've ever talked about this, but. I certainly, when I started running, I had a lot of fears and doubts mm. about whether first I was really going to overcome this eating disorder ever mm. and just had some fears about, you know, having confidence in myself mm -hmm. and um, still I struggled mm -hmm. with my body image for quite a while, but I still had a lot of fears and doubts about um, just about everything. So, yeah. um, can you describe some of your fears and doubts that you had along the way? Yeah. Well, um, uh, growing up with a, a controlling dad, um, I felt powerless in my own life. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it makes complete sense to me now that I was physically powerless right. uh, in my body. Like mm -hmm. I, I had extreme fatigue and I couldn't get stronger, Right. but that was, that was also mentally, emotionally, how, what the reality of life was with mm -hmm. my dad. Right. And, um, and then with my brothers and, um, my second brother was always bigger and stronger mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. heavier than me. Right. Um, all growing up though, he never won a wrestling match. <laughs> I, I was determined not to let him win, but, um, is he watching this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that was kind of, that was already a part of my story mm -hmm. uh, going in. And then, um, and then I started experiencing some successes. Like one of the first things that helped was dialing back from a full body workout mm -hmm. because I was just so physically fatigued and exhausted. Um, right. I would work one muscle group, whether it was just biceps or just triceps or whatever. And so I try to go to fatigue with that one muscle group and keep the rest of my body in a state of peace and calm and, and mm -hmm. almost meditation. Um, and and that was the only way I had enough energy to recover the muscle group that I actually worked. Right. And then the next day I'd pick a different muscle group. And mm -hmm. so slowly working through the body over a week or two. Right. And that was the first time I started getting significantly stronger or, mm -hmm. or seeing progress. Right. right. And um, But then I'd been doing that for a little while um, for two, two years, a little over two years before I got my first, uh, job in fitness mm -hmm. and worked at the YMCA. And so, um, even though I was, you know, studying exercise books and creating workout plans for myself, I'd already gone through massage school and taken kinesiology classes and, 
and all of that was redesigning my workouts all the time and and I knew what movements worked what muscles and what muscles were involved as a primary mm -hmm. and secondary and assisting and stabilizing right. and um, and all of that stuff um, I still had never worked out in a gym before hmm. and so here I was working at a Y and uh, giving people tours of the equipment and where to go mm -hmm. and how to use everything I didn't do my own workouts there yet right, right. <laughs> and it actually took months Right. for me to be courageous enough to like start sneaking in and doing some workouts mm -hmm. and then leaving when a big guy came in right and right. then you know uh, all these other things but I, I it was really nerve-wracking because I felt like a fraud and you know these guys had grown up playing sports and mm -hmm. being trained in the gym and taking gym class and all this stuff and they just naturally you know, knew all this stuff about right lifting and working out and i was i was learning it too but not in a group setting like that and right. not not in a setting that most people were familiar with and so i was like having to play with stuff for the first time and just like not worry about who was watching mm -hmm. um, and then later on realize you know most people are caught up in their own thing Right. And even right. if they've like look amazing to everyone else, they know that one area that isn't responding like everything else. Mm -hmm. And they feel like everyone's probably thinking, oh, what's wrong with them for not right. fixing that one area? Right. Um, right. And no one's thinking that either. But right. um, but yeah, so yeah, definitely um, a lot of uh, fears and doubts along the way. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of correlated with with as I grew in confidence in my own workouts and getting stronger. Um, also realizing that I know what I'm talking about when I talk about fitness and where I've mm -hmm. come from and, and everything I've learned along the way because I continued to um, get educated and, right. and uh, go to school for everything that I was teaching and all that stuff and so mm -hmm. um, to get to the point where I can put myself out there and say hey I am an expert in these areas right. Uh, right. It took a long time as well, and right. it was a growth process, right? For sure, validation, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I like what you said, uh, especially when people are first starting to get into fitness and get active and mm -hmm. wanting to reach certain goals and things. I know the gym can be a very intimidating place. In fact, it it usually was for me uh, until I started working in a gym. Kyler mm -hmm. and I worked in the same gym. Mm -hmm. And so just a quick message to anyone watching is, you know, when you're in there to not focus so much on what you think other people are looking at or what they're focusing on, because most likely they don't see you unless you're on a machine they want to use or <laughs> something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, just you know, try to avoid comparing yourself to other people. And this is true also for races. I've certainly been on the starting line and looked around me and thinking, oh, they're, they're probably faster than me or they probably did more training than me and, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And mm -hmm. over time, I just had to realize that this was my race mm -hmm. and, you know, Kyler had to realize this was his workout mm -hmm. and uh, to not, you know, judge yourself and then compare yourself to other people so mm -hmm. um do you want to talk about all the activities that you do because oh yeah i mean he does strength training but there's been yeah, some other yeah. things he's done too yeah so uh, i feel like strength training is the one thing that's like really personal uh to me because um weakness really defined the first 22 years of my life and so being able to play with weights and just see how strong I can get is is something that's like a, uh, just very nourishing and very encouraging to me. And it's like my personal meditation time mm -hmm. uh, to be in tune with my body and figure out um, how much I can lift and, and how thoroughly I can um, fatigue my muscles. Mm -hmm. um, but I've enjoyed a lot of other um, activities over the years. Um, and so growing up, we um, we had very limited um, experience with sports and, and overall were not allowed to play sports because they were a distraction from God. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so we, I didn't really get to um, engage with that or, or dancing or anything. And so I, uh, when I got back, back from boot camp, uh, from my initial training in the Marines, because I joined the reserves, um, I looked for dance classes. I was curious about ballroom, but I didn't find any, but I did find um, Scottish Highland um, oh. dancing yeah 
and um, it was at, it was being um, hosted at a uh, ballet studio. Hmm. Um, and so they told me if you take the Scottish Highland, you have to take be taking ballet lessons. Oh, and I was like, okay. I'm not taking ballet lessons. <laughs> um, but I thought about it, and I was like, okay, maybe maybe I'll try it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for the first few months, every week I went home. And I was like, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not going back. But right. um, I kept going back, and I I kind of I got to see what music looked like in movement form, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, this is really cool. So I was I was there. Uh, for um, eight months at that studio and then uh, took a break and then um, went to a studio in Salem for six months and then I moved to the Albany area and I took a, a few summer classes over the years. So I've done um, uh, adult ballet uh, over the years um, and my last experience with it was just um, this last year um, in on the coast where I'm living now I, mm -hmm. I took some uh, adult ballet for a little over a year and um, so that's been really good for uh, muscle memory and, and training for um, agility and strength um, in a way that I don't normally mm -hmm. train right. um, another activity was um, uh, well soccer was always my favorite but I um, obviously like I just said I didn't um, play mm -hmm. on teams right and yeah. so um, I was 25, almost 26, and I decided to join um, the indoor sports park um, mm -hmm. in Corvallis and just signed up for their house team. And that, that was another thing, talking about fears and doubts. Like, I was yeah. super nervous, you know, assuming that <laughs> even though other people maybe weren't as fit as I was mm -hmm. at the moment, um, they probably grew up playing soccer I was assuming right. that for everybody right um, and then they also have this little gallery where people can come and mm -hmm. get food and watch the games and you can hear everything they're saying <laughs> um, about about the play and about the right. players and um, so it was it was super nerve-wracking but um, I really um, enjoyed it and I ended up um, organizing a team after that first uh, season and um, a group of us played together for four years mm -hmm. um, and so that was really awesome I really developed as a soccer player and learned how to play. Right. Uh, so that was so much fun. And then um, another thing I learned at the um, YMCA was uh, volleyball. Mm -hmm. And so there was a couple of really good volleyball players there. And um, we have a staff and members game every Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. And so that was how I learned how to play uh, volleyball. And then um, uh, three years ago at my job, I uh, took a job in Michigan. And one of the assignments was um, uh, the pickleball uh, program. Oh, so I, I set up that. and and tore down the pickleball uh, twice a week and um, that's where I learned what it was and how to play and I totally got addicted. So I play every week um, once or twice uh, when I can, usually two or three hours at a time. And um, so much fun. If you don't know what it is, it's a, like a smaller, faster version of tennis, uh, two on two over a net um, with a uh, rubberized wiffle ball and a big paddle mm -hmm. and um, yeah so much fun um, and that's the, another thing I've, I've learned through the process of being an adult and learning these sports that most people learn as a kid mm -hmm. um, it, and, and most people don't go back and learn a sport as an adult right. they stick with whatever they did as a kid and then when they can't mm -hmm. do it like they once did it and they can't mm -hmm do the things they once did they think I'm old and they quit um, right. and um, and so the the thing that I've learned is that it doesn't it doesn't matter how good you are there's no way I'm gonna be the best anything <laughs> at this point uh, for any of the sports but I can get really good and I can have a lot of fun right and if I I, I my plan because uh, I'm um, a year and a half away from 40 uh, is to continue to um, play soccer and volleyball and pickleball for mm -hmm. as long as I possibly can and to never assume that I'm getting old but that I just need to you know train differently right. and adjust my training mm -hmm. and um, and so uh, becoming older or, or what most people assume is getting old um, has more to do with the years since they've done something right consistently Mm -hmm. rather than what age they are right how many years they've been alive right um, yeah. and so consistency is is the most important thing and if you're having fun doing something don't let anything keep you from going after it mm -hmm. right 
which is a little bit of what I talked about in my other video about being a back back of the pack runner. A lot of us have doubts about whether we should even be in the race. You know, we're usually the slower runners and oftentimes, sometimes the bigger runners, although I find that's not really true, but people think <laughs> that. And, uh, but they feel like over the years, especially older runners, they get slower, it just naturally happens. And so I know some of those runners really doubt whether they should race anymore or whether, because they're not winning races anymore, mm -hmm. should they even mm -hmm. participate yeah. and uh, things like that. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you in most of my races, there are plenty of people in their 70s and 80s crossing the finish line hours before me so uh especially one person but uh, someday i'm going to catch him but uh, <laughs> but just to you know point out that you know you may not get to the pro level or anything mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of people in your league or group or club mm -hmm. uh, that feels exactly the same way and so you're really not alone in in feeling maybe some fears about engaging in a sport that you haven't mm -hmm. played before or played in a long time because no matter what you still deserve to be there i mm -hmm. think just the desire to participate is mm -hmm. is enough regardless of how you know good you are at it so and i think most people are pretty accepting of mm -hmm. anybody's ability so yeah um, Most people yeah. are a lot more accepting of others <laughs> and their insecurities than they are themselves right. and their insecurities. Yes. So exactly. yeah, you'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Which leads me to my next question. Do you have you know advice for anyone watching this video who maybe they're on their own journey of healing? Uh, perhaps they experienced adversity at some point in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was mostly childhood and, mm -hmm. and probably I'm assuming kind of the same for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but there may be some people watching that um, have faced some adversity and kind of wondering, where do I go from here and how do I heal from this? And usually there's a little, uh, you may agree with this, but there's, uh, for me, for running, there was just a little spark or something that indicated that running was going to be my path mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to healing. And uh, so when people get that little spark, I always encourage them to mm -hmm. pursue that because it's meaningful. It, it means something that something mm -hmm. is driving you to do whatever it is is you want to do for me it was running mm -hmm. and uh you know i've stuck with it ever since but um, yeah 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 so anyone yeah. on their own journey you know do you have advice for yeah people yeah I, I definitely agree with that um when i meet with clients the first time it's uh it's always an interview first mm -hmm. and most people assume that uh, because i'm the expert and they're coming to me that they'll just tell me what their goals are and they'll tell them how to get there. But I always want to interview people first because um, I feel like that internal guidance is so important. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like Patty said, if you have uh, kind of a, a nagging desire that just doesn't really go away, um, that should be where you start. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, some people, you know, we're athletes in high school or college, and then it's been 10 or 30 years uh, since they've done anything. And so that can be challenging just because you remember what your records were and mm -hmm. you could re you remember right. what you could lift or what you could run or what you could, um, you know, how you could shoot or how accurate you were or whatever right. um, the scenario is. And um, so the most important thing is to not compare yourself. Mm -hmm. Give yourself grace for all the years you've not done anything with that. Right. And uh, just be where you are uh, right now. Right. And just kind of track it, observe it, uh, do do your best, but don't um, over push, overdo mm -hmm. the um, exertion or whatever, because um, it, your body will adapt. And mm -hmm. it's amazing what, how, what the body can recover from or uh, get back to. Um, and if you've never done anything before, same same thing. Don't don't compare yourself to someone else that maybe your age, but's been doing it their whole life. Mm -hmm. um, always just start where you are. So if it's running, you know, just do uh, the walk jog around the neighborhood or whatever. Yes. Um, whatever you can handle for as long as you can handle it, um, and then just try to be consistent with it. The most important thing is the consistency because mm -hmm. you're if you do something consistently two or three times a week or more, and it doesn't have to be more. 
Uh, but if you do it two or three times a week, your body's gonna respond more to the consistency of that mm -hmm. and adapt to it than if you do something really impressive for five days straight and then you burn out. Right. Um, so, um, so just uh, have patience uh, with yourself and uh, grace for um, the time that it takes to adapt again um, and just confidence knowing that your body will uh, get to where you want it to be. So pursue your passions first, mm -hmm. uh, whatever sparks joy. For some people it's being in the water, swimming. Some people it's playing a sport. So just try to make sure it's low key. Uh, if you like basketball, start with, you know, uh, playing hoops with the kids or grandkids um, before you sign up for the league um, or, or whatever it is. So, you know, make it incremental and start with um, a reasonable step mm -hmm. and then progress as you feel comfortable with it. Right, right. And I think it is really important no matter what activity or component of fitness you want to engage in that mm -hmm. patience of course it's always going to pay off mm -hmm. uh, I know I can mostly speak for running uh, I've done some other things but you know you just have to be very very patient with yourself when mm -hmm. I was training for my first 50 miler um, you know I had plenty of doubts along the way because you know I I get to mile 20 and be suffering and thinking mm -hmm how am I going to run another 30 miles? Mm -hmm. And one day I was on a training run and I was, you know, going through all these doubts in my head. And then finally I just said to myself, you know, you're doing the work. I, I was putting in the work. I was putting in the miles. And at some point I just told myself, you know, these doubts aren't going to help you. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. you know, talking to myself. Yeah. Um, and once I kind of talked to myself about that and moved on with my training, uh, everything changed and I no longer had doubts and I just had to believe in myself mm -hmm. that I was going to accomplish mm -hmm. what I wanted but I really did just have to be very patient I think changes in your body just happen mm -hmm. slowly and yeah. I think it's better when it happens slowly because yeah. like you said you kind of you can burn yourself out mm -hmm. pretty quickly if, if you're pushing too hard at first so I think patience is really a big key in, in anything that you want to do um, sport mm -hmm. or not mm -hmm. <laughs> so right and then uh, as far as uh, specifically for the gym if you if you do feel like you need to get into the gym and get a routine but you're really nervous about uh, the gym environment um, you know make incremental steps with that as well so uh, let's I'm assuming you've already signed up so you've already gone to the office you've talked to the person um, and you've left um, so then the next time make decide I'm gonna make one loop around the whole building, use the restroom and then leave. Right. Um, and then the next time uh, you can sit and observe. Um, and if, uh, meeting with a trainer can be super helpful uh, mm -hmm. because you can tell them what your goals are, what your needs are. If you're nervous about that, just remember uh, you're the client, you're the one paying, they're working for you. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can decide what you want in the session um, or you can interview the trainers um, or even just you know walk the treadmill and observe the gym until you find one trainer you think you might be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're in charge of the journey, so don't feel bad about um, uh, specifying what you need mm -hmm. and uh, taking it as slow as you need to. But don't don't let go of your goals just because um, it's nerve wracking mm -hmm. to get started. So right. always go after it. Yeah, absolutely. Which is a great. <laughs> Great way to, to wrap up a little bit. So uh, I think we've covered quite a bit. Um, I would love to do you know 20 more videos with Kyler because we both have so much to say. Uh, but I'm going to kind of wrap it up right now. I will, uh, do you still have a blog? Do you have your blog? Um, I do, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to link your blog in the Perfect. description. Okay. So um, he's a wonderful writer, has some great stories to tell, much more than we could accomplish today. Mm -hmm. So feel free to look at that. And then if you have your own story, your own journey you would like to share, feel free to drop some of that in the comments below. And don't forget to like this video, uh, give, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe if you want more videos like this. I am planning to... Uh, try some other videos similar to this having some guests on i think it's really important and perhaps more interesting sometimes than just uh, watching me in front of the camera uh, and then also if you have other ideas for videos you would like to see we'll um, 
as I talked about in the beginning, I've done some other videos that I think may relate to this one as well. So I'm going to uh, link those in the description below as well. So uh, again, I hope everybody is training hard. And I know right now there's a lot of, uh, you'll probably be training for your fall marathons right now if that was your goal. And uh, so I wish you the best of luck uh, with that. I'm sure you're going to do great. Uh, there will be a video coming up about my races that I have for the rest of 2019, but uh, I'll save those for another video. But uh, do you have any final thoughts or anything you want to share? Uh, just um, stay in tune with your, your own heart and your own goals. Don't um, let your, your potential and your life be defined by anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times when you are getting started with... Um, positive changes of any kind um, the people around you that are comfortable with you being the way you are um, and how you fit into their life um, and they're not ready to change they're gonna uh, resist um, mm -hmm. your changes and try to discourage you from your goals so <clears throat> have the earplugs handy and um, just um, uh, keep reviewing your goals and remembering uh, why you want to do it and making yourself a priority um, a lot of people, especially if you care about others around you, sometimes uh, can make themselves less important than the people around them. Um, but if you believe that everyone has value, that means you have to believe that you have as much value as everyone else. And you're the only person living your life. Um, and you're the only person in your body. Um, and so if you don't take care of you, who is going to? No one else is going to do it for you. So right. you have to prioritize yourself because um, that's what you're here to do. You're here to live your life. Right. So do it. Yes, yeah. Well, thank you so much, yeah. Tyler. I yeah. really enjoyed this. And this was fun, thank you. Yeah, 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 it was my first interview awesome. video. Awesome, you did great. So um, <laughs> look forward to more of those and we'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.